Tulalip has a long history of art forms within our culture. One tribal member from an early age was driven to learn the art styles of our heritage through beading and weaving. Taylor Henry has taken off in his craftsmanship and continues to be inspired in new directions with native art methods. He has recently had his art showcased on a national TV show that aired on ABC. Keybulb Conversations had a chance to sit down with Taylor and hear how he has blossomed into his art. Hi, I'm Michelle Hernandez and welcome to Hebulb Conversations. With us today is Taylor Henry. Thank you for joining us, Taylor. Hi. Will you tell us a little bit about where you grew up? I grew up here on the reservation. I grew up right down the road on Cosita. And tell me about your family tree. Um, my late mother is Crystal Gobin. My dad is Vince Henry. Um, my maternal grandparents are Rhonda Gobin and James Morris. Great grandparents are Tom Gobin and Noni Cooper. Um, Jay, Cecilia Morris and Ron Morris. Um, my paternal grandparents are um, Rick Henry and Anita Pacheco. My great grandparents are uh, Lena Shelton and Ernie Cladisby. Okay. Yeah. Where did you go to school? Um, I graduated from Toilet Heritage in 2009. Um, I went also went to Marysville Junior High and Marysville Middle School and Cosita Elementary. And what did you do after graduation? Um, I took a year off and I just focused on beadwork mostly. And then I became an outreach driver for uh, Baracha. Okay. And what do you do now? Now I am a rediscovery project lead. We currently do uh, distribute kits. So it's either a beading kit or a weaving kit or some kind of cultural craft with um, a plant medicine that's in it. And we have videos that show you how to make that kit. <laughs> and so the goal of those kits was to bring art to the community, right? Yes, it was a, through the pandemic, we we're struggling to f you know, figure out how to reach the community. So we came up with a kit distribution once a month and the how-to videos and we've reached a lot more people than we would with our regular culture nights. And classes. And classes, yeah. yes. So how many kits, since I think you started this in the fall of 2020, right? Mm -hmm. How many kits have you distributed since? So the first month was the average, our first couple months was about 230 and we've gone up to average of 400. Mm -hmm. And our biggest one was f almost 600. Wow. Yeah. So through mm -hmm. those kits, I and my daughters have learned to bead earrings through the very first mm -hmm. drive through kit. <laughs> and I know that oh, I text you all the time asking yeah. you how to finish <laughs> this and do that. But what other feedback have you gotten from the community about these kits? Like what have people learned to do? Um, a lot of people love the beadwork, yeah. the beading ones. Um, a lot of people have talked about the weaving ones and they've always wanted to, they never knew where to go or who to ask and they've found that these kits are the perfect start because it's a, our goal for this first year of the kit distribution was to do a basic uh, skill level mm -hmm. and then move up hopefully every year with the skill level. So that was our intention was to get people started and get their foot in the door of how to do these cultural crafts. Yeah, and it just has spiraled since then, oh, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, in my house, our beading collection is getting <laughs> ridiculous. That's good. Yeah, well, Lewis thinks I should start selling it so I can keep buying. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Told him it's not that good yet. Um, what is your favorite kit that you have done so far? Um, probably the pen kit. Okay. I've always liked to do the peyote stitch. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that one's my favorite, and a lot of people have um, responded back saying that they loved it, and the videos were very helpful. But I, I think that one's my favorite so and far. All those videos are available 
um, on the Hibob uh, website. Mm -hmm. With the whole, with every craft kit or every video has um, a supply list too, right? So anybody yeah. can. You can, it has a supply list so you can go and purchase them yourself if you miss the kit. Okay. Yeah. So when you're planning for the craft kits, how do you come up with um, what you're going to offer and then how much planning and preparation goes into the creation of our drive through craft days? So me and my coworker, Virginia, we s had to go through all of our inventory of all the supplies we had. So we, we had to cut down on a lot of them. So we sat down and we talked about it, all this materials that we have and how can we distribute it and, you know, distribute the wealth, I would say. Mm -hmm. So we sat down and between the both of us, we can hit a lot of different uh, crafts mm -hmm. uh, with them. So every month we have to prep an enormous amount of cedar <laughs> or supplies for the beadwork. Um, leather for the moccasins. Leather for the moccasins, <laughs> the headbands, the roses. So it takes almost a whole month up to the day, day before, week of the distribution to get these ready for, to hopefully have enough for everybody. Yeah. So. And what I think is so neat about it is mm -hmm. everything you and Virginia offer, you can do yourselves. Yeah. Yeah. It's a it's an amazing thing. I think it's a very good, good opportunity for people mm -hmm. that don't know anything about a craft and they want to get started. Yeah. Yeah, I particularly love mm -hmm. it because attending events is hard when you have a full-time job and kids mm -hmm. and we can do it at home. So it's made a huge difference in my household. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Taylor. We're going to take a short break, and when we're back, we'll hear more about what launched Taylor's passion for beading and weaving. Welcome back. Today we're here with Taylor Henry. Taylor, from what I understand, you learned to bead in junior high. How did you get started? Yeah, I learned in junior high, I needed an elective for credits, and I seen that beadwork was offered, so I like, I always wanted to try it. So I took the class, and since then, it's just, you know, took off from there, like like wildfire. <laughs> <laughs> Who was your teacher? Um, her name's Ivana Little Eagle. Okay. And then, for the class, and then her mom really took me under her wing. Uh, Aurelia Stacona from Warm Springs and she taught me even more and more about the background of beadwork and how things came to be and probably more of the teachings of it. Okay. Tell me some of the types of beading that you've learned. So in the class the first project was a loom and then we moved on to lazy stitch and then we did peyote stitch, which is the pen. Okay. You can do a pen, you can do anything that's like in a round form. Mm -hmm. um, and then we moved to f flat stitch, which is uh, was t taught to me with the one needle. Okay. And I couldn't, I couldn't do that. I couldn't do what everyone else was doing. It just, the one needle was not working for me. So Urvana had me try two needle and it just took off from there, and I, I've never been able to do one needle beadwork. For flat stitch? For flat stitch. So what do you make with flat stitch? So earrings, medallions. I would be curious to see <laughs> that process, because <laughs> I just really have that one mm -hmm. needle going. <laughs> it it can, very, can be very confusing, but yeah. it works the best for me. So you just gotta find what works best for you. So aside from flat stitch, peyote stitch, and lazy loom. stitch, loom, anything else? Um, I've done brick stitch, but again, that's not my... It's hard. It is. It's a test of patience, I'll <laughs> tell you that. <laughs> I can attest to that. Yes. <laughs> I tried it. Um, and you talk about lazy stitch. I've never mm. heard of that. So what do you do with lazy stitch? Um, so I've done bags. I've done earrings. Okay. I've done moccasins, mostly moccasins with lazy stitch, okay. um, leggings, headbands, bracelets. Um, you can almost do it on 
almost anything. And so these are different beading styles. What about different mm -hmm. beading techniques? So the techniques is again the one needle and two needle. Mm -hmm. I've seen people use three needle. What? Yes. <laughs> I haven't tried that yet, but um, so the techniques, you know, with the peyote stitch, it's the one needle, you pick up one bead at a time. Mm -hmm. Same with the, um, the lazy stitch. It's one needle, but you pick up anywhere from two to nine beads at a time. Okay. Um, the two needle is one, one needle has your, your beads, mm -hmm. and then your second needle is to tack them. So, you know, you're working with both hands, you have to be ambidextrous mm -hmm. to be able to do it, you know, one way and then go back the other. Um, the tech, the other part of technique is, I would probably say, um, called like the running stitch. Mm -hmm. It's also the same thing with the one needle, but it's I best describe it as like a chain. So it just kind of loops into itself. Okay. You know, there's different, different ways you can use the one needle, mm -hmm. but there's all different kinds of techniques. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you, so you started in junior high. Mm -hmm. Did you bead through high school as well? Yes. Ever since I started doing, ever since I took the class, I couldn't stop. I yeah. just had to be and I had to go home, buy what I could and what I knew I needed. Mm -hmm. And then I just went home and did bead, did my homework, did bead work. And by the time I got to high school, my senior year, I was kind of pushed into teaching and I did the, okay. my senior project was the beading class. Okay. So I had to teach the beading class my whole senior year. Like every day, once a week? Every day. Okay. Every day till it was done. <laughs> teaching, grading, helping, teaching all the different techniques. And I kind of went back to the way I was taught, you know, start with the loom, start, you know, then lazy stitch, the peyote stitch, and then flat stitch. Mm -hmm. So that was, it was a fun year. <laughs> and how many people do you think you've taught to bead? Mm. Oh, easily a couple hundred students. That's crazy. And do you think yeah. most of them are still beating? No. Okay. <laughs> I would say a handful of them are. Mm -hmm. um, maybe about 20 of them are still beating. Okay. Um, after high school, you continued to bead. How has your work evolved? Um, so during all the way up and through high school, I did smaller projects. You know, medallions, bracelets, earrings little things, and then I started to move on to uh, like summertime powwow regalia, okay. full outfits. You know, that can go from, you know, head to toe. Yeah. So it's it's evolved in that way, and I've done like more, I've done portrait beadwork. Wow. Um, like more intricate floral work. Um, I have to think about that one. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's it, it's came a long way and it's it's definitely been worth it. Yeah, and when you look mm -hmm. back at your earlier work, what mm -hmm. do you think? <laughs> you just uh, criticize my first it? thought was <laughs> what was I thinking? <laughs> you know, this could have used a lot more prayer. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's mm -hmm. what I need in my beadwork prayer. <laughs> <laughs> You're also a wool weaver. Mm-hmm. And what sparked your interest to start doing that? So I did beadwork for about 15 years. Mm -hmm. And the cedar weaving was in my life. It was, I knew how to do it. I could, I could make something if I needed to. But I wanted to see where, what else I could do. Mm -hmm. You know, I can, I can, I've mastered, people say I've mastered beadwork. Um, and I felt comfortable enough to set it down and try something new. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that there wasn't a lot of wool weavers in our community. So I ended up taking a class in 2014 and it sparked my interest. So uh, it was a headband class and I just did headband after headband mm -hmm. there. Then I got into more Who classes. did you take that class with? The first class was with uh, Danielle Morset okay. from Suquamish. And then uh, Tilly Jones, mm. 
and Susan Pavel mm -hmm. were the rest of the classes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And do you have any mentors? In um, I would always say Danielle first because mm -hmm. she was my first teacher. Right. And then um, Susan Pavel is an amazing teacher, an amazing weaver. Um, she always has good things to say. Mm. She always wants you to be in a place, you know, when you're at your loom, you know, have that good energy, good energy, good thought, good mind, good heart. Um, I, re I don't know. I really look up to her yeah. for weaving. What types of things do you weave? Um, headbands, temp lines, belts, blankets, uh, this mat. <laughs> um, shawls. Shawls, okay. cover shawls. Yeah. And um, what are the different weaving styles? So there's, in Coast Salish weaving, there's mainly two different st styles of weaving, which is the twill, the herringbone twill, which is you know, under two, over two. And you can see all the warp and all the weft. You can see, see it all. Mm -hmm. And then there's twine, which is this. It's, you can't see any of the warp. It's covered front and back. Okay. And it's a two strand twine. So it's you know, it's done by hand. There's no shuttle involved. So those are the two main techniques. There's also a tabby weave, which is like under and over everyone. But that's that's rare to see it. <laughs> How does uh, your culture influence what you weave? Um my culture it's the blankets, like this one, is, they're, you know, they're the foundation of the Coast Salish people. You know, we have to use the blankets in everything we do. You know, when a baby's born, that's the first thing they're put in is a blanket. Right. And throughout our lives, we need a blanket to do anything in a naming, a marriage, you know, coming of age. You know, the blankets are there. And when we leave this, this world, we're wrapped in a blanket. Mm -hmm. So everything we do as Coast Salish people involves a blanket. Right. So this, and then this one is a replica of a Coast Salish blanket that's in a museum in Finland. Oh. So I wanted to, you know, my little rendition of it. So I decided to make this one. <laughs> I love it. How long did it take you? Um, this one took me about two weeks. That's not bad. After work, weekends. Just constant, constant, mm -hmm. constant weaving. <laughs> I understand that you have learned to process wool. Uh, can you explain the details? Yes. So when I first started weaving, I always wanted to start from the beginning, which is, you know, taking the wool either from the shared point or sharing it ourselves to carding, to picking, carding, spinning, dyeing if needed, to weaving. Um, me and my coworker got an opportunity this summer to do wool processing classes at Evergreen, so we we jumped on it. And the first part was the processing part of taking mountain goat wool and learning the di two different types of the wool, the guard hairs and the undercoat, and blending it with all of our traditional materials, which is you know fireweed the fireweed fluff, cattail fluff, and then some um, duck down feathers we incorporated in there. And then we just blended a little bit of sheep wool to help it uh, align it for spinning. So we got to do that. The processing was the first set of classes. And then the second part was the spinning. Mm. So we got to spin all the wool that we got to card, the mountain goat wool. We got to spin it and then practice other spinning too. So that was an experience. Right, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. And then we we got involved with the mountain goat culling project in Port Angeles. So that those classes helped us with that. We got to help process the mountain goat. Wow. And I think during that week we were there, we did about seven or eight goats. You know, that's a once in a lifetime opportunity to see that many goats right in right. front of you. 
Yeah. So that was that was an amazing experience. Yeah. This is all in the last year. All in this last summer. What yeah. a year. Yeah. <laughs> uh, here at the Hebulb Cultural Center, we had an exhibit on wool. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yes, it was a couple years ago, 2017 I or 18. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tessa Campbell asked me to, I was just beginning weave, beginning to weave then, and she asked me if I wanted to um, put a piece in the exhibit. Mm-hmm. And of course, I said yes because it's an you know it's an opportunity, an opportunity to goal. have yeah. your work out there and not only out there but in a museum, mm-hmm. in an art museum. Yeah. So I jumped on it and made a a sash mm-hmm. and a matching headband. So that was it was in there for a year. Yeah. And it was it was just amazing to come in and yeah. just just crazy to me to me to see it behind the glass and be like, I made that, yeah. you know, that's just, just yeah. awesome. You had work in here before for our um, art exhibit too, I believe. Yeah, yeah, I did a beaded crown. That's right. For that. Yeah, for that. that's yeah. right. <laughs> Thank you so much, Taylor. It's been so interesting hearing about beading and weaving and mm-hmm. what got you to where you are. Um, after this short break, we will talk about your art featured on TV. We'll be right back with more Hebulb Conversations. Welcome back to Hebulb Conversations. With us today is Taylor Henry. Welcome back, Taylor. Um, ABC's Grey's Anatomy had a Native American storyline last year on one of their episodes, and your cradle board was featured. Tell me everything (laughs) so my friend messaged me and she was like I need a cradle board and she she messaged right back it's not for me (laughs) (laughs) she goes "Uh, my work needs it and I can't tell you anything I can't tell you what it's for Um, I can't tell you anything about it I just need it what I just need one and if you want, I can take your contact information and I can pass it to somebody that can explain it. So that was a Monday. <laughs> Tuesday, the I get a phone call from LA and it's the prop master for Grey's Anatomy. And he's like, is this Taylor Henry? I'm so-and-so from, I'm the prop master for Grey's Anatomy. And then that was the first time I heard what it's going to be for so you know my jaw hit the floor and I'm like no way right no way <laughs> you know I was, just, I was in shock and he's like uh Kalina passed me information and we need a cradle board will you be interested in doing it and I was like of course why not right. yeah <laughs> so that night I had to draw up a design and okay. send it to him Wednesday was it was approved and um, so that night I stayed up all night all night working <laughs> on it. When did they need it by? So I worked on it Wednesday night. Thursday night it was finished and in the mail. Oh my gosh. They needed it that Friday. Oh my goodness. So one, five days. Yeah. They needed it. <laughs> How long have you been doing cradle boards? Um... Lord. <laughs> a long time. A long time. Yeah. Um, over 10 years. Right. So what was the process like of designing a cradle board that was going to be used on Grey's Anatomy? Like, So they needed a Coast Salish cradle board mm-hmm. is what they told me. So my mind instantly started going. The wheels started spinning. Yeah. So it was a red cradle board. So I'm like, well, Coast Salish red is pretty powerful for right. us. So that was the main color. And... Right now, my focus is weaving, and on the back of the board, I put a spindle whirl design. Mm -hmm. And then, me being Tulalip, I was like, well, I'm going to do a killer whale design because, you know, we're the killer whale people, Mm -hmm. and that's, a killer whale is pretty strong in all Coast Salish territory. Um, So I did that, and then there's a, a band in there with the Coast Salish elements. So um, I wanted to hit that too. So, you know, we this is a Coast Salish cradle board artwork. It needs to represent 
the Coast Salish people. And what was the storyline of the show? So the storyline was um, this lady was pregnant and her grandfather ended up getting COVID and was brought to the hospital. And he was the knowledge keeper, the language teacher, um, the storyteller, and she was fighting for the doctors to keep him alive. Mm -hmm. And she needed him alive for when her baby was born so that they can do their ceremonies for the newborn. And um, she ended up going into labor when the grandfather was in the hospital. So they got to do their little, their ceremonies mm -hmm. for it over Zoom. Over Zoom, yep. And you can see the mom and the dad and the baby in between yeah. with the holding the cradle board. Right. And everyone here in Tulalip mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. all over <laughs> knew it was going to be so i think facebook was the funnest that night everybody oh, yeah. just waiting for yeah. the cradle board <laughs> in the last few minutes of the show oh yeah it was amazing you made this community and so many mm -hmm. communities very proud thank you <laughs> what was the feedback you got on the cradle board from the show's producers oh the feedback was amazing yeah. it was overwhelming yeah shared from, everywhere shared everywhere <laughs> thousands of times yeah as soon as I posted it, people are commenting, messaging, calling, texting. Yeah. Every form you can think of. Yeah. They're so happy and so proud. And, you know, it was just... Were you overwhelmed? I was. Yeah. I was overwhelmed. It was <laughs> It was an amazing thing. Yeah. What an experience. And a very, very amazing experience to see that on an international TV show. Right. And I'm a like, very popular one at that. Very popular. Yeah, it's been running for like 17 <laughs> years. I'm like, you can see artwork in the back of yeah. local artists, but there's never Be been featured. a piece mm -hmm. in the show like right. being used. So I'm yeah. like... And it was yours. And it was mine. I'm like, I got to do this right. Yeah. So, <laughs> Did you have a watch party? We did. We had a okay. we had a kind of a big watch party. Mm -hmm. My family through have made dinner and had, you know, decorations and... So fun. We had probably about 20 people over watching it and, you know, every time they went to commercial, it's like, it's coming up, it's coming yeah. up. And everybody was just on pins and needles on the edge of their seat. And, you know, my grandma started crying as yeah. soon as I'd seen it. And she was, you know, she's an emotional So proud, person. I know. So happy. It was, yeah. a, it was amazing. <laughs> yeah. What an experience. It was. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Mm -hmm. It has been my absolute pleasure to talk with you and learn about your artwork. And we appreciate you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for watching Keybulb Conversations. I'm Michelle Hernandez. Until next time. <laughs>